I begin with a bold claim. In my view, the human ability to design has played a crucial role in human evolution. It is the mental processes involved in design activity that have allowed us, for better or worse, to dominate the planet. Biologists describe Homo sapiens as occupying the cognitive niche in the natural world. Humans are unique amongst animals because of the flexibility of their response to changing circumstances. Our big brains have allowed us not only to adapt to the environment, but also to change it. But we not only change the natural environment, we also create a made environment. It is the ability of the human mind to design that makes this possible. Design is one of a number of activities through which humans shape the future. The particular area for design is material culture in all its complexity. Material culture is not simply practical. The made world of villages and agriculture, towns and cities, communications, industry, houses, shops, entertainment, personal possessions and homemade things is the result of beliefs and desires, ideals and values, as much as f functional necessity. In shaping the future of things, designers are in fact working with human behaviours. Performance and values interact with each other to create a made environment which attempts to support and reflect the purposes of human beings. Although design activity is a universal aspect of all human societies, its character varies dramatically from one culture to another. The way designing is carried out and who does it depends on the beliefs, values, resources, political organisation and technological know-how of a particular culture. The world is living through a period of rapid industrialization, one of the effects of which has been to hugely enlarge the scope of material culture. Inevitably, this has also enlarged the scope and importance of the design professions. Everywhere we look in the modern environment, we see the results of decisions taken by designers working in the context of industrialization, consumerism, social responsibility and sustainability. Design activity has a long history. It goes back to the first tools, the invention of cooking and the creation of places in which to live. Specialist designers, essentially master craftspeople, emerged in the first city-states in India, Iraq and Egypt. These were architects, surveyors, water engineers, military technologists, tailors, jewellers, what we might call graphic designers in the shape of scribes. There were even designers of scientific equipment who made devices for forecasting the phases of the sun and the moon. Craft-based design works so long as the pace of change was slow. New and better products developed from previous examples by slow refinement. This began to change gradually as a result of economic competition and warfare. Both areas required technological supremacy for success. Innovation was needed. Industrialization increased the pace of change exponentially. People also began to think about their surroundings in a new way. They accepted the idea that the future could be different from the past and in a positive way. They began to believe in something called progress. Designers are people whose job it is to imagine the future and help bring it into existence. The future may be quite a short distance away, as in the design of an animated graphic for a newscast, or decades away, as in the design of a high-speed railway. More and more designers have to consider not only the thing they are designing, but also the long-term effects on society and the environment. Today the design professions range from aeronautical engineering through to fashion design. The growth of these professions matches the content of material culture. The dramatic emergence of digital technology has not only transformed the way designers design, but also what they design. Film, television, the gaming industry, advertising and fashion are the stuff of modern popular culture and all support flourishing sectors of the design professions. Professional designers aren't the only people who design. 
It is worth noting that everybody takes part in designing in their own lives, and in particular, their own environment. In creating a home, people are carrying out a mini-design project. Their development of social media and responsive production methods seems certain to give these consumer designers much greater influence in the future. Traditionally, the different design professions have been kept apart during training. In Britain, there have been three main routes into design, art schools, architecture schools, and engineering departments. All three derived from craft routes, where apprenticeship was the normal way to get a training. Perhaps surprisingly, the art school route was the first to move on from apprenticeship. In 1837, the British government established the first design school. Beginning in London, this expanded quickly to become a nationwide system. The motive was to compete more effectively with France and Germany, and to provide a group of skilled, applied artists to work on such fields as furniture, ceramics and textiles. In contrast, the great engineers of the early 19th century nearly all learnt on the job, and they, in, they, in their turn, founded world-famous engineering companies which were centres for training as well as design and production. Young architects continued to be trained in the offices of established practitioners. The move into university courses was gradual, and the design schools, now art schools, stayed outside the universities until the 1970s and 80s. Most teaching in these institutions was conservative, the first school to break away and teach design in a radically new way was the Bauhaus. Established in Germany after the First World War, it set out to encourage creative thinking, modern design and the development of social conscience. It also attempted to see design as a whole, from art through architecture and engineering to technology. The Nazis forced the school to close but by creating refugees with school staff and students, dispersed its influence all over the world. Bauhaus ideas were influential in Britain after the Second World War and led to the country's art schools becoming vibrant centres of creativity in art, graphics, fashion and product design. They offered students freedom and attracted a remarkable range of individualistic misfits who, for a while, made British design the most influential in the world. That phase ended in the late 1970s, and it is doubtful if the move to professional art and design education into universities has been a good thing. For reasons that will come apparent later, conventional academic organisations find highly creative people and unconventional bodies of knowledge difficult to deal with. Where does design fit into the curriculum? We suggest a radical answer. Design is neither art nor science, but it is creative and it is rational. It draws on the visual and aesthetic world of art, on the physical, mathematical knowledge of science. It also uses insights from technology, the social sciences, sociology and economics. It is concerned with planning, architecture and engineering, as well as product, graphic, fashion and media design. This might seem to be an eclectic mix. It is designed simply a mixture of other disciplines, with no essential core of its own. Does design depend on a distinctive thought process and body of knowledge? The answer, I believe, is... Yes. Neuroscientists focus on the ability of the human mind to create concepts. Some are hardwired, inherited concepts, and some are the result of culture and personal experience. These are known as synthetic concepts. Language is a familiar example. Humans appear to be hardwired to be able to acquire and use language. However, culture and personal experience have resulted in there being many different languages and an extraordinarily rich and vivid use of words which is dynamic, changing and expanding. 
Since design is always about the future, we need to ask if there is an identifiable thought process which makes it possible for humans to deal with the future. Humans are unique amongst animals in being able to imagine the future could be different from the past. This seems to be wired in. It is the relevant inherited concept. But equally, as with language, humans can imagine an extraordinary variety of different futures, the result of cultural influences and personal experiences. What makes this possible? A form of cognitive modelling known as imaging is the key. Designers have to be able to see in the mind's eye. They imagine future places, products and communications, and they foresee how they will be used. In practice, they not only see things in terms of space and colour, they also imagine every other quality. But the model in the mind needs to be developed and shared if it is to be made into a reality. Designers in every field have developed particular ways of doing this. Sketches, plans, drawings, models, prototypes, verbal descriptions, computer simulations, mathematical calculations, storyboards, layouts and many others. These are the way of sharing with other people, users, clients, other designers, and anyone who has a stake in the outcome. But also, and essentially, as a medium for the designer to manipulate his or her mental model outside the mind and to develop it further. Designers also make use of prior art. What has already been made and imagined is a vast storehouse of knowledge about how to design and make things. There also exists a great deal of know-how about the best way to develop a design idea. Designers may have valuable experience of handling materials and making things. They need aesthetic insight. A feature of design situations is that it is very unlikely ever to be a single possible best resolution. There will nearly always be a variety of viable designs and the choice will de depend on balancing a complex of conflicting values and resources. Teaching and learning design is also unusual. Designing, like riding a bicycle, playing a musical instrument or brain surgery, can only be learnt by doing it. Most effective design courses at any level of education are structured around a series of carefully chosen design projects, supplemented by more formal learning about prior art, performance of materials and modelling media. This unusual profile suggests why design may find it hard to fit in with more familiar school subjects. And LDP's publication, Design Education, A Vision for the Future, helps to highlight in more detail the school circumstances in which design students will flourish. In our view, design has the potential to become a third dimension of the curriculum, focusing on skills for handling the future and with its own body of knowledge, what could be more relevant in a world where change is the norm? Until the 1960s, there was little design education in Britain's schools. Two related school subjects existed alongside one another, and this is still the situation. Art and design broadly relates to the art stream, and design and technology to the engineering stream. Both touch on design, but seldom cooperate effectively. During the 1970s, there was a sustained attempt to bring the two together with design activity at its core. Professor Bruce Archer at the Royal College of Art made a substantial contribution to the theoretical basis for design education, and we continue to draw on his work. However, the impetus has not been sustained. In a recent publication edited by Eddie and myself, we suggested that it was time for the two streams to come together at last. It seems probable that the failure of design areas related to the built environment, in general education, is connected with this divide. Architecture, urban design and town planning 
are important design content in children's lives, but they do not experience them in school. Eileen Adams' career and her related book by LDP demonstrate the possibilities and indeed the opportunities. If design educators really got their acts together, there is the potential to make a substantial impact on the curriculum. As Ken has explained, the design field can be thought of as comprising of many design areas. In fact, it's claimed that more than 400 have been identified. And it's possible to train as a specialist in many of these areas. Traditionally, design education programmes in higher education have been largely defined by the design area that their graduates aspire to join. However, for design in general education, the criteria are much less clearly defined. Can children be provided with meaningful learning experience in, in all these design areas? The conventional curriculum design strategies adopted in the 20th century in order to address this complexity tended to rely on building experiences in a variety of contexts around various models of a or the design process. It's understandable that such strategies were adopted, but were they really the right direction? Clearly I never thought so, but I was not able to persuade many colleagues that a change in emphasis was needed. I remember the design line being proposed as a means of introducing the meaning of design to school teachers, but I believe it was only ever intended to be a descriptive model. It's entirely reasonable to say that human life goes through various stages, infancy, early childhood, adolescence, etc. And this has some descriptive value. However, it doesn't tell you anything about how to live, successfully or otherwise. Models of designing seem to have moved from descriptive to prescriptive status with remarkably few objections. Strategies for living life successfully are normally met with much more balanced scepticism than models of designing promising successful design outcomes. This was why I presented this model at the Design and Technology International Millennium Conference, a non-linear model of designing that was developed by Phil Roberts when he was working at the RCA on the Design in General Education project, to which I added knowledge, skills and values, embodying technology for design as a constraining cord. It demonstrates Phil Roberts' conception of designing as resolving a mismatch between the current and the desired state of affairs and my early thinking on design epistemology. I illustrated this model through a discussion of the Polymer Guitar Project at a later Design and Technology Association conference in 2003, but design process models continued to flourish. In David Spenlove's contribution to LDP's new book, he makes the case that design and technology in its existing form is facing a rapid demise, and posits the emergence of design and or technology too centred around the rapidly growing interest in design thinking. The concept of a T-shaped designer, expert in one area, but able to engage with other disciplines in a multidisciplinary context, is becoming very familiar within design education programmes in higher education throughout the world. In 2010, Blomberg published their analysis of the 30 world's best design schools. The American design schools were the most represented, with 13. Eight were in Europe, with three in the UK, and five in Asia. Loughborough Design School wasn't amongst them, but it had only recently been formed. In this fast-moving world, multidisciplinary approaches to designing are becoming increasingly common, and hence any designer's involvement is increasingly broadly based. The movement towards more general design programmes in higher education lends some support to the idea that their introduction to general education might now be timely. In 2010, Ken Baines gave the John Eggleston Memorial Lecture at the Design and Technology Association Education and International Research Conference at Keele University. The lecture was entitled Models of Change, the Future of Design Education, and Ken proposed seven key themes around which a future vision of design education could be framed. The aims of design education, the significance of practical education, encouraging the imagination, the cognitive value of aesthetic awareness, the value of learning through making, the creative relationships between designing and making, and the educational purpose of doing design projects. These were discussed in greater depth by leading design educators in LDP's first publication, Design Education, A Vision for the Future, and maybe they're worth a closer look. Within Loughborough's Department of Design and Technology, now Loughborough Design School, there was no recognised design process. 
in fact one of the modules for which I had responsibility, design context, specifically aimed to convince year one undergraduates that there never could be a design process. Every project was different. Given their years in secondary education, this could lead to some challenging but essential debates. Without them, we could find undergraduates wondering if they should come up with some more ideas before handing in their design folder once their project was complete, fearing that there were not enough. One brilliant concept does it really. Once you recognise that there's no design process, concepts like the application of knowledge from other disciplines seem to be on shakier ground. If designers do not have a process that they go through and to which other disciplines can be linked, what do they have? How do they design? Well, our answer is, and has always been, modelling. Design students need to be equipped with as many modelling skills as they can learn. 2D, 3D, mathematical, verbal, language-based, computer-based. And, of course, the development of their cognitive modelling capability needs to be supported. When faced with an ill-defined or wicked problem, it is designers' modelling capabilities that matters, not a process. Ken Baines' Orange Series seminars concerning modelling can be freely downloaded, and his book, which was 10 years in the writing and built on the seminars, is available from Loughborough Design Press. My contribution to design education was not to teach the students to design. That's a fundamental human capability that they were born with the potential to develop, just like walking and talking. My contribution was to help them develop their modelling capability and hence enable them to be better designers.